welcome everybody who's joining us. I hope um, uh, you can see and hear us okay. Um, please do use the chat, by the way. Um, so I just want to introduce to you um, uh, Taber Izali, who is our guest today to talk about her wonderful game, Ava. Um, we're going to uh, have, have a really nice session which begins with some sharing of imagery and iterations of work that went into the game making and we'll move through a, the story of how the game came about and then some really practical considerations about uh, Taber's journey, her developer's journey and how she um, you know how she moved through the complexities of budget constraints and uh, came out the other side with a wonderful game which has had some great reflections and great responses so we're going to uh, talk about all of that. Um, I'm saying hello to Jan in the in the chat. Um, Jan is one of my students, so welcome, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to have you with us. And um, so, I met uh, Tabea two years ago um, at the Women in Games conference when uh, Tabea, you were talking about the game that uh -huh. you were going to make, and now here you are with a finished game which is amazing, it's a great journey. Um, would you like to just talk about it and share your screen with us and show us some of the work that went mm -hmm. into it? Absolutely, uh, give me a second. Thank you. Let's... So, there we are. So, I'm gonna just show you several screenshots of the game and some GIFs. <laughs> and um, Sharon actually asked me to you know, have a special focus on how the game changed over the years. So it has been three years since we have been working on the game. Um, and the first inspiration basically was Dragon Age Inquisition. I don't know, maybe some of you know the game. I personally never played it, which is a shame. <laughs> I know. Um, however, uh, I was so inspired by these uh, Dragon Age Inquisition tarot cards and I really wanted to do something similar. And in that summer, I actually had the time. So I started working on that. And this one was the first illustration I just did at some point in my free time. Um, as you can see, <laughs> doesn't really live up to the inspiration, um, but I was really inspired and I, when I finished the illustration, I just felt like, well, you know, I'm a game developer. I like when things are interactive. Wouldn't it be super cool if this illustration would be interactive? So I went ahead and made another illustration. Um, and as you can see, we have some animated things in there. We have some particle effects and we have actually interactive elements in there. So you can move um, the woman's whale and you can move these fruits and so on. And I realized that this would be a great idea for a puzzle game. So yeah, I went ahead. And during the process, I started to look more into fairy tales. So we came from these Dragon Age tarot cards and went into fairy tales because I felt like, well, you know, fairy tales uh, have a story so we could have a game with a story. And they also have these beautiful illustrations in the book. So it's always, you know, kind of this page with a story and then you have this wonderful illustration. And I felt like this would be a great base for, for a puzzle game. So I went ahead and made this prototype where you have this fairy tale book, you have the story, you can turn the page and solve a puzzle. And yeah, that's where a lot of changes started to happen because you know we went from tarot card to this fairy tale and we started to do more and more fairy tale stuff. Um, we had to redo several illustrations because we just felt like it didn't match um, the style or the, the puzzles were not fitting. And since the illustration and the puzzle are basically, you know, one and the same, you had to change everything. Uh, one thing that went through, I don't know how many iterations was the UI in particular. Yeah. Um, I feel like we did it three or four times 
Um, and we really had this iterative process where we would leave stuff in the game, even though we knew it's not perfect yet, um, but we just don't have the time, we will fix it later. And I love that pro process, but I still think we're in the middle of it. So I wouldn't be surprised if there would be more changes in the future if we do like a director's cut or you know the definite edition of the game or something like that um one big change that i would like to mention is that we actually you know i mentioned earlier we went from tarot cards to a fairy tale book and we actually reversed uh that like one and a half years or one year ago um, so we went 180 degrees backwards again because we started to show the game at conferences and fairs and we realized that players prefer the tarot card aspect or they are much more interested in the tarot card aspect of the game than in the fairy tale aspect. And we started to realize that it's mostly or a, a reason for that also was that we wanted to make a game about being a mi minority member uh, about diversity and when we talked to the players we realized that for a lot of them tarot cards actually were part or tarot was part um, of their journey in that topic uh, we had several players telling us that um, they started to, to do tarot by themselves to claim back power over their lives and stuff like that. So we realized that the tarot cards were not just, you know, a beautiful, pretty um, inspiration for the illustrations. It was actually an important part of our message and a part that really resonates with um, people when it comes to to these topics that we wanted to talk about so we went back from this you know paper texture paper colors uh, book aesthetic to a more tarot card aesthetic with um, mysterious color schemes with purple and uh, these cosmic <laughs> background stuff um, and we started to implement more uh, visual elements that resemble cards uh, rather than books. And we also started to go back to tarot cards more literally. Uh, we, we, we started to look at tarot cards and study them. What is their meaning? What do the visual elements in the tarot cards actually mean? So um, these are two examples from the fourth chapter, which is um, not even in product or, you know, it's not, uh, we, we finished illustrations, but there it's not even um, in the game yet. So that's actually <laughs> a sneak peek. And we started to work more with these traditional tarot cards. On the left, you have the high priestess where we had these elements of the globe and the moon and the scroll. And on the right, we have the fool so we try to implement these major arcana way more in the game. And we almost got every card in <laughs> because we also had to see if it fits with the story of the game and so on. But we almost managed it. <laughs> so we're pr pretty proud of that. So one last thing I also wanted to talk about um, is how the illustrations uh, changed over time. And this is actually mostly due to our story because we realized, well, if we want to tell a story about, or a, if we want to make a game about diversity and being a minority member, um, it's not enough to just tell a story. It's also important who is behind the game and what's the vision of the team behind the game. So this slide, this slide is from the first chapter of the game, which was mostly illustrated just by me. And we wanted to uh, have a more diverse team as well to have artists and team members from around the world, from different backgrounds, from different cultures um, to really support the message we're trying to send. So 
this is the first chapter. Um, then here we have uh, some illustrations from the second chapter, which were already uh, made by more illustrators. And you can really see how the illustrations change, how they become more unique. And here we have um, illustrations from the third chapter where almost every level is made by, by a different artist. So um, that's one thing that really changed a lot um, from the beginning and that's really close to our hearts and is really important to us. So yes, that's basically it um, in terms of <laughs> pictures. Thank you so much for sharing those beautiful images. And um, it's so fascinating to learn about how things changed from the beginning through your ideological viewpoint of your mm -hmm. project. You know, you were bringing in people from all over the world and, and being very flexible about, you know, also embracing the idea of very different art styles within mm -hmm. the game. That was a big change, wasn't it? it it's Absolutely. Really, that's a, a huge example of how you can throw away one idea and replace it. If you're not precious about it, you can really replace it with another idea which is more valid. Um, it's very, and, and we had a sneak peek, which is very, <laughs> really always good. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about the the story origins because mm -hmm. this is a really important aspect of of the game and and how it came about. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about your starting point and and why this game came around and and what's what you feel is important about its message? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um... When I started working on the game with these first illustrations, um, this was immediately immediately after I left the last company I was working for before I started to do games on my own. Um, long story short, it has been a very toxic um, environment in that company. There was a lot of abusive management and um, of course, there were also a lot of experiences when it comes to, you know, being a woman in the gaming space or in the game industry, which were, well, they had a big impact on, on my professional life. So I was working for the company and it was really bad for my, my mental health, but I felt like I can't quit because I only have been, I had been working for the company for just some months and um it really looks bad on the cv especially in switzerland i don't know how it is in other places if you just work for a company for several months and then leave mm. um so i was very afraid to to do that uh so i stayed as long as i could but after nine months i just i couldn't take it anymore and i i had to quit i had to take some time to recover to um um, do some self-care, uh, think about if I wanted to work in that industry, which has a lot of problems, which we all know of crunch and sexism and so on. If I was able to survive in, in that industry, if I wanted to work in that industry. So this was basically uh, the starting point and, and these thoughts were important to me when I started working on the game because I realized that I don't just want to make any game I wanted to make a game um, that is that where I can talk about the things that are important to me um, especially because game development is not exactly a job where you're like okay five months we're done with this project let's move on <laughs> so yeah if I wanted to do something uh, if I wanted to do a game I really needed to you know be able to uh, stand behind the message we're sending with it and um yeah that's basically how the game i mean started. i have to say you know i i so commend your bravery <laughs> you know i'm sure all of our audience feels the same so brave to to say these things out loud because of course you know it's difficult to say them and what i find particularly you know um, inspiring without wishing to be totally cheesy <laughs> which i i i am <laughs> but i i think that um you know the the 
the sort of marriage of ideas in your game between the purpose of it and its aesthetic and its meaning through the tarot. You know, you mentioned the taking back of power um, mm -hmm. in, on the part of players of the tarot and you kind of wedded together the reasons why you were doing this project and its its substance. And I think that's just an amazingly kind of um, inspiring response to hardship. You know, it was a very difficult time, but what you did was you turned it around and made it a positive thing. You know, you didn't mm -hmm. kind of uh, leave. You didn't, you didn't say, right, I'm not going to do this because you obviously love game development and it's obviously the right thing for you to be doing, <laughs> you know, but you did turn it around, which I think is just such an amazing achievement. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit now about um, the journey, the developer's mm -hmm. journey, having uh, kind of looked at the story behind behind the game and look at the particularly the practical constraints so you you were starting from a position of you know not zero because you had all your wonderful experience but how did you set about making your own game I mean that's a very as you say it's not a project for a couple of weeks and then you say yes I've done that now thank you <laughs> how did you set about you know approaching these practical constraints of budget and uh, time and effort how did you do all that uh, at first, it wasn't actually a problem because it was just a project uh, I made for myself. Um, it was actually very important to me because, as you mentioned, um, you know, coming out of a bad situation and taking power back, uh, it also it felt like you know being able to create something is is the only way to to change something about the situation. If you're just one person, you can't really change a whole industry and you can't you can't even change the circumstances for the people around you. But um, creating a game or creating something was just, you know, some way to to do something. Um, I think I just in the in the beginning, I just started working on it. Um, I was pretty lucky to get some support from the Swiss Arts Council Pro Helvetia, which is basically one of the only ways in Switzerland to get funding for game development. Um, so they supported us in the beginning a little bit, and they uh, actually it, their funding allowed us to to actually fund our studio and found our studio. So that was great and and then it was just you know um I feel like everybody who who was and is working on the project it's it's not it's not a job for us it's it's our passion uh and I'm really 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 grateful to have a team um who has that um yeah, where you're thinking, and that really feels like for everybody of us, for all of us, it's it's a way to express our feelings. Um, however, of course, if we are talking about you know healthy uh, work uh, conditions and uh, being a minority in the game industry, it's also important to not just let people work for free. So we try to find funding in so many different places for the game. Um, and it was really hard because uh, even though we all believed in, in the game and we still do, uh, it was just really hard to pitch something that is so far away from, from games, from the typical games that we know, and also is made for a different target audience um so you know like one moment that just stuck with me was i was pitching the game in front of uh a jury of 20 people or 15 let's say 15 to not over <laughs> exaggerate so 15 people and just one of them was a woman all mm -hmm. all others were just um mm -hmm. men white men in their 50s and um they just asked me why are you doing this game? Um, because if you want to do a game, you should do something like Battlefield, because um, that's where the money is at. Sorry, I'm laughing. <laughs> but that's just, you know, that's a terrible thing to say to you. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, they're right. There's where the money is at. But, you know, it's um, not 
the vision that we are having and uh, not the audience that we are uh, looking at. So yeah, it was just really hard to somehow uh, communicate the message and the target audience and the the reasoning and USP behind the game to actually get funding. And yeah, so so it's, this presumably this was this particular panel, you know, was not enthusiastic, but then somebody was enthusiastic. <laughs> so what kind of practical steps? you know, can we share with the audience about how you pitched your project? What kind of things did you think about when you were pitching it and how did you present it? Mm, that's a that's a really tough question, actually. Um, I think the biggest or the biggest tip that I, or what was important for us was finding um, the, the, the right uh, institution or company that actually uh, understands what you're doing. For us, it was the Arts Council. Um, and and basically, yeah, the rest is was basic, where it was standard pitching. Um, so for us, it was less what we're saying in the pitch, but rather, of course, you have to, you know, adapt the pitch to every person you're pitching to. However, we felt like um, it was rather about finding the right people to to talk to, mm -hmm. and we're getting continuous support by Prohelvetia again and again. Uh, so it's it's, you know, besides all the money and being able to work on it, it's just really amazing to have an institution that you know really stands. Or behind you and really has your back and again and again um, shows that they actually value what you're doing and they appreciate what you're doing because um, yeah th three years are a long time without people basically saying hey I really like what you're doing here yeah yes the creative process can be lonely if you don't have that kind of support and it does sound as though you really did your research and your research really helped you to find that audience in the practical steps of getting into actually being able to make your vision come true. Um, uh, so I'm, uh, we're getting some questions, which is fantastic, and I'm going to save them up like gold dust and um, ask you them <laughs> at the end. Um, so I just want to then move on. So we've we've gone through the sort of, you know, d the, the part of the journey, which was researching and finding your um finding your backers how about so you talked initially about the importance of feedback um from players so you know in the iterative process you had lots of feedback from players who were talking about how they were responding and and they and they helped you to make that 180 degree turn that you mm -hmm. mentioned about you know in the creative process so returning from the fairy tale path that you'd taken to the tarot um how did you set about getting that feedback during the process of creating? So did you set up a kind of pre-publication, uh, you know, platform so that people could look at what you were doing and play? How did you actually get in touch with that mm -hmm. audience for, to get that important feedback for iteration? Um, we mostly did it through through just going to conferences and fairs to to actually talk to people uh personally i think it's not the same to just send people a build and then send them a, a google form or something like that and just ask them to answer questions it just it was very important to be able to stand next to the players to watch them play uh to have actually a conversation about it that is also open and not just you know basically um pre or biased based on the questions you're uh, you're asking in the questionnaire i think that we wouldn't have found back to to the tarot topic if we wouldn't have been able to just have conversations and chat with with the players um for us it was also important who who actually was interested in the game because if you're if you're at the fair, you just have people walking by and you will see which people are actually stopping by and are 
interested in the game based on the artwork that you are showing at the booth and so on. And I feel like if you have to do this online, um, you already have to pre-select the people or they are pre-selected by the people who are following you on social media and so on. So for us, it was really important to, to just have that organically at the fair. And also for us, it was important because it did reaffirm um, our target audience as we would see, hey, it's exactly the players that we are trying to work for that are stopping based on our poster and you know coming to our booth because they're like oh look at this one i want to see what it is right i mean that is lovely isn't it and we're all missing that kind of you know, human interaction with each other so you know we are all i think kind of thinking you know when can we go back to those wonderful kinds of events where you can just meet people in person and establish that rapport um, do you think there are ways in which, so let's think about how the timing has been fortunate in some ways. So if you were at that stage now, what would you kind of recommend? What would you think of doing in the absence of those kinds of events? How would you start out now if you were, you know, at that point in, <laughs> in this kind of, you know, situation where we're all being digital all the time? Actually, um, I don't really know. It's it's. I think it's new to all of us. Yes. Um, we have been at some digital, uh, ex, uh, uh, like um, I'm forgetting the word. Sorry. Um, like game, expos. game from yeah. expositions, yeah, yeah, expos, and uh, we felt like it's as as visitors as well as exhibitors. Um, it was really hard to actually just browse and, you know, um, look at all the things that are available. It was really hard to um, actually just find new stuff. Um, and what worked best for us so far was still, even though I said social media doesn't work, <laughs> uh, it's still social media. Um, just posting about uh, the things you're, we, we are posting about the things we're doing. We are having a developer diary or we're starting one. Um, we started to just ask questions on on Twitter, uh, building focus groups. We started building a focus group, but it's still too early basically to, to say like, oh, this is the way that worked best for us. We're still exploring that ourselves sure. basically. And you have you have a little um, slide which is um, uh, showing the, uh, the um, uh, sorry, we're in, a, we're in a small space and now I can hear some of them. Mary Claire and I are together in a small space. So I, might, I might actually take you somewhere else while we're speaking. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to go down. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I'm going to just, you're coming with me. I'm taking you all with me. <laughs> Sorry. This is like, this is what we were talking about when we said embrace the challenge of the digital mm -hmm. space, but it's in relation to the actual space. So I'm just going to take us to a new venue, a new exciting venue um, <laughs> where we can't hear each other. So um, I was just going to say you have a slide Tabea, which um, shows your Twitter uh, details and everything. Could you share that with our audience? Because I'm really, um, I'm really keen that everybody watching should be able to join your your developer diary and you know follow your development process. I think it would be so nice. Can you share that with everybody? Mm -hmm. so we can... Absolutely. So the adventure. Sorry, everybody. The adventure. <laughs> It's also nice because it's a little bit, you know, like the conference that is digital is kind of local too because you are both no, at the conference. Really. <laughs> so it's really lovely. No, it feels more real, doesn't it, somehow? And you think that somebody's not just in a kind of um, abstract space. They're really they're alive and well and living in a, you know, an environment that's familiar somehow. That, so that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so this gives us our you know, uh, for the ways to follow you and follow your progress. And I'm so keen that everybody should be able to 
to do that. Um, it, it's, um, it's, I, th I think we've kind of reached a point where I'd really love to be able to celebrate your success <laughs> with this game. I know you're very modest about it, but your game has been doing so well and you've um, been selected for the Smithsonian Indicate, um, you know, exhibition. So if anybody would like to just go to the Smithsonian Museum site, they'll find information about the game. And it's been selected from, you know, a pool of a very large pool of games for, for them to consider. And that's just such a wonderful, um, you know, result from something that came out of a difficult experience to, to make something so positive out of it, which now has all this wonderful recognition. So yes, I'm, I'm joining with Chloe and saying, congratulations. Thank you. For being in the chat. It's fantastic. I'm so happy for you. Um, what are your reflections now, you know, on the experience and how do you feel in relation to, to what you've achieved, having had this recognition and, you know, lots and lots of um, positive response to the game, which feels as though it's going to go from strength to strength. What are your feelings about it now? Mm, I think for, for me, it was, I, I'm really happy that everybody who worked on the game uh, had the, the passion and power to, to just say, no, we want to, we want to finish this game. Uh, we want, we believe in this game, uh, even though, like we mentioned earlier, there were some budget constraints. So at some point we, we, we were at the point where we said like, okay, we're, ha we just have 50,000 US dollars. That's not a lot. That's not enough to make a game either. Um, we just, we just, you know, scrap it um don't finish it work on something else start something new that is more successful hopefully in terms of funding or we just really really make an mvp with just the tiny the, the the smallest possible product and we're trying to to release it and we're going from there um so i'm, I'm really happy that we decided to do the the latter yeah. <laughs> option and just uh, finish it um we because very happy to <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it was important for us because it, 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 at some point if you're going through development and it, things are not, just not going the way you want you just start to feel self-conscious about the game and you feel like okay look at all these other games that are coming out they're so much more polished they do have so much more content uh, why should anybody care about the thing that we made um, and want to play the thing that we made and that's why i think that this this feedback this recognition was was so important to us to realize okay no there are people who who care for the things that we do that um yeah share our vision and our thoughts about the project and the topic behind the project so i'm 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 really happy we did that yes and I think that it's so interesting the whole project has has come out of moments of adversity and i think that um you know being able to respond to difficult things in in a really positive way is terribly inspiring for other people you know the the idea that you can take the initial experience which was awful and turn it into such a positive project and then at moments when the budget constraints and the difficulties of actually the practicalities of making a game were oppressive and sometimes those moments that you described of a lack of self-confidence about the project you know come in and fill you with doubt or insecurity, you were able just to go, no, wait a minute. There is our audiences out there. We know who, who they are. We're not aiming for those people in the suits who were, you know, who in the pit who were lined up and saying, you know, this isn't this isn't the money making, the money spinning area to go into. We were convinced about what we were doing and uh, it came to fruition. So I think it's it's just a terrifically inspiring story. Um, and what do you feel about the future? So if we kind of move to what's the what are the next stages for you? What do you feel is next? What's coming? Um, I actually don't know. Uh, we wanted to actually finish the game like half a year ago, and uh, we got some further funding, 
uh, so we had we we were able to make more chapters and now again we were at the point where we were thinking like okay um so we finished the, or we're working to finish the four chapters um that's that's going to be the end of that game mm -hmm. um and now again i can't talk about it yet um yeah. but it, there were again things happening where we were okay maybe uh, the story of ava is still not uh finished so mm -hmm. i'm I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to the future to see um, where this is leading. Um, I think it's a, it's a great start. Uh, the game actually, and the whole process of making the game um, did create our studio. It did create our vision as, as a company making a diverse game for games for a diverse audience. And um, I'm, I'm really, I really think that uh, or I hope that there will be a lot of more more things uh, for Ava or also for our other project that we started working I'm on. So exciting! It's very. It's always uh, you know. It's that's wonderful news. I'm so glad. And um, I do just. I'm sorry to bang this drum, everybody who's watching, but it, it's the idea that you know your ideology um, can form you know, the ideas and uh, desire to, to, to work on a creative project can make something real happen. And that changes everything, um, I think is just fantastic. Um, so I have a question uh, from earlier from Jan, who's asking us, um, in hindsight, do you feel it would be better for you personally to have started working on your own game right away? Or do you think you needed the job experience of working in a company first? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good question because that's a question I asked myself a lot uh, too. Um, I was, uh, I did study game design before I started working for Swiss game companies and I was working for other companies for like three years. And I do have uh, other students that, you know, um, graduated together with me and went directly into founding their own studio so i have basically i had the direct uh, i could compare and sometimes especially in the in the hard times of working for other companies i felt like um the people who founded their own studio just were way ahead of me and i did the wrong thing and made the wrong decision however um i also worked for a company called blind fluke in those three years uh which was a an amazing experience uh they do, they create indie games based on um political topics such as um migration and nuclear war and stuff like that and just learning from these people who have more experience than i had was so important for me and also i felt like um i was able to learn from others in in a time where i wouldn't have had the experience or strength to do something on my own mm. um so uh <laughs> no i think in hindsight it was the right way because if it even if the the bad things wouldn't have happened I wouldn't have um, made this project mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have this company and these beautiful and um, wonderful co-workers uh, that I do have now. So um, it was great to just um, be able to work in the industry without having um, to shoulder all the weight of the responsibility yeah. <laughs> myself. Straight but of course yeah. the other way works too <laughs> yeah so so perhaps yes you're kind of you've benefited from both sides of that question haven't you you've kind of taken from both sides and actually i think it's immensely important also that you're you've benefited in the end from a from a very difficult period and a difficult time and that's sort of the, i always think the best revenge is living well <laughs> you know whatever the problem i think the best revenge on whatever it was is living well and doing well and you're just such a fantastic 
um, proponent of that. I think it's wonderful. Um, well, I've run out of time. Um, and uh, so um, Jan is thanking you so much for your answer and saying um, <laughs> he's asking because as a student, he's thinking about his options and he's wondering about the future. So it's great to have that answer. Thank you, Tabea. Um, well, I'm going to just um, wind up our session and just by thanking you so much and uh, saying how very delighted I am that this has <laughs> come to be and that you've shared it with everybody today. I think it's just a wonderful fantastic and brilliant thing you've done and um i hope very much that our audience are as inspired as i am so <laughs> thank you very much tabea and please do everybody follow um follow the the uh the details on screen and follow ava's um progress uh which sounds like it might be coming <laughs> there'll be more watch this space <laughs> also feel free to ask any questions um we are twitter I, I will try to answer anything um that i can if you didn't have the chance to ask questions now thank you very much that's really kind thank you so much and thank you to our audience who are, who are um getting in touch and saying thank you too to to Tabea. It's been great to talk to you and uh, what a great celebration of all of that work that you've done. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Thank you so much. Have a lovely too. rest of the conference, everybody. And Tabea, I hope you can um, watch some of the little bits and pieces if you have time. There's some great sessions coming up. Absolutely. You'll we'll stay with the conference and stay with us and share some more information there's a very very good ending to the conference too which everybody should stick around for which is the funny women who i think i'm just looking forward to so much because they look absolutely hilarious <laughs> but thank you everybody and thank you for your patience with me moving around uh, <laughs> and, and taking you with me so um hope to speak soon thank you so much Tabea. thank you too thank you Bye. for everybody <laughs>